الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيبنا وأسوتنا وقدوتنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتاب الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم السياب كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلهم تتقون أيام معدودات صدق الله العظيم الحمد لله We are here inshallah in the mosque of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even the outside, which is mashallah, 20 degrees plus. <coughs> a lot of the brothers, ancestors and the children are probably enjoying the lovely weather which we are having. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our coming here to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So inshallah, I will just have a, a, a brief introduction. Uh, but before I delve into the topic of Ramadan and Mubarak, just a couple of things which I would like to clarify for our Hadirin here and those who are watching online, our sisters upstairs. Uh, just two quick uh, points <coughs> I would like to uh, mention, um, which I had mentioned last week in my talk, that we had the month of Rajab, which is just about to end in a few days' time. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it is known in many hadith that he fasted in this month. Also, a lot of the rawayats uh, mentioned that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ascended to the heavens in this month. It is not something which is, uh, you know, categorically 100% confirmed, but there are many rawayats that confirm to us that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ascended to the heavens in this month. So really, what should be our actions? I mean, we have many calls from brothers and sisters, you know, in the locality, from around the UK, that, you know, what should be our uh, action? What should we do? You know, we always get asked, you know. So really, the, the answer is quite simple, that what you do as an individual, there's no limit to it. Whether it is fasting, you are doing dhikr, where you're doing salahs, where you're doing whatever you are doing, do as much as you can. There is no limit to the nawafil in the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When it comes to acts which are farad, faraid, then they are clearly defined uh, in our uh, law, in our sharia. So the ones which are farad, we follow them with the ones which are sunnah, the ones which are mustahab. Each one is categorized individually. So I would advise you to, to do as much as you can of ibadah in this month of Rajab. And also the same goes for the month of Sha'ban. We have a lot of uh, brothers and sisters asking, you know, the 15th of Sha'ban, you know, what should we do? Should we have special arrangements? And really my, my response would be that, you know, uh, just do as much as you can. Fast, not the whole month, but most of the month. If you can fast 10 days, 20 days, 25 days, 23 days, whatever amount you can do, do it. And again, it goes back to the near of the individual that when you do something nafal, nawafil, it shouldn't be <coughs> advertised, it shouldn't be, you know, uh, mashhoor, it shouldn't be told, you shouldn't tell people that you are doing a nafal fast even. So it's something which you do individually and there's no limit to it. There's no need for you to, you know, gather people around or to have a special sort of arrangement in the masajid or in the, in the houses you can have certain activities, <coughs> al-qad, reading of the Qur'an, which is, again, it's a good act which you can do. But I don't think you, you must really uh, make you make you distract from the main uh, objective of the Sharia, which is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all times, through your five daily prayers, through your uh, salawat and khamsa, your fasting in Ramadan, your fasting outside of Ramadan. And this is something which we will cover, inshallah, in the next uh, few weeks. But today I'm just going to give a very brief introduction uh, to the next few weeks, what we will cover uh, in these, there will be four, four, lecture, four talk, talks, four reminders. There will be one starting today. Uh, and then there will be a gap. Next week we have uh, Sheikh Abu Sundas, he will be coming to visit us inshallah to give a talk on happiness in the home. Very beneficial talk, so I encourage all of you to uh, participate either uh, in the body or in spirit online if you can. And also, we will follow up the next following week, the thir third week, second and third and fourth week. So we'll have four weeks before Ramadan of Mubarak inshallah to finish uh, whatever we're going to cover inshallah. So the first week, very, very simple. I will introduce 
the notion of Ramadan, what does it mean? How did it come about? How did the Muslims start fast? What was this fast before the month of Ramadan? And also, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that fasting has been prescribed to you as it was prescribed to those before you. So who, who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about when he says those before you? Was there a Ramadan before us, before the Ummah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? This is which I will cover very briefly today as well. And also, how was the early fasting of the Muslimin in Mecca and Medina? And also, we will cover why should we fast? What is the benefits of fasting from a spiritual uh, perspective, not from a health perspective? I mean, that's something which a doctor will tell you why it is good to fast, why you should fast, you know, once a year, twice a year. But we will come from it, to it from a spiritual side, from, a, from what Quran tells it. Why should we fast uh, in the month of Ramadan? And that will be the first week. The second week, we will cover two things. One is the internal fast and external fast. So what are the hidden types of fasts? And what should we be doing during the month of Ramadan? And what should we be avoid during the month of Ramadan as well? The third week, we will delve straight into the fiqh matters of the uh, fasting. So everything from the intention up to the time of fast, who must fast, the breakers of the fast, taraweeh, itikaf, layl qadr, what invalidates the fast according to the madhab of or maslak of Imam Abu Hanifa. Rahimahullah ta'ala ta'ala. So we'll stick to one madhab uh, in the fiqh. And then the last uh, final week, we will cover uh, topics such as the last 10 days of Ramadan, the itikaf. Laylat al-Qadr, Eid al-Fitr, and also Zakat al-Fitr. So the last two weeks we mainly concentrate on the fiqh of the month of Ramadan. So that's just a brief introduction. We'll start inshallah with the Quranic ayah, Ya Yuladeen Amal Kutiba alaykum al-Siyam, Kama Kutiba ala ladheena min al-Qabli, Kuna ala kutab taqoon. Again, I will be using mostly and mainly for the for this and the next week will be from the Tafsir Ibn Kathir Rahimahullah Ta'ala, Imam of Tafsir. So Imam Tafsir, Imam Ibn Kathir, he says, he's telling us that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, he is commanding us to fast. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is commanding us to fast as it was prescribed to those before us. So here Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is talking about Ahlul Kitab, the people of the book, the Jews and the Christian days to fast before uh, Islam. And they used to have different types of fasting. Now the fasting in Judaism, they have a day called Yom Kippur, which is a 25-hour fast. And it usually falls on a Saturday, but they, they change this throughout the year, but they try to hold it on a Saturday. And it starts from sunset to the sunset following. So it's a 25-hour fast. It's called Yom Kippur. But obviously the uh, Bani Israel, they had 40 days of fasting at the time of Musa alayhi salam and after his event. And they used to fast, but as time passed, they got rid of the 40-day fasting and they stuck with the Yom Kippur, which is a yearly fast, one day yearly fast. The Christians, they have a Lent. Uh, again, it also was a, a long fast, usually 40 days, 30 days, but they have also, they have uh, reduced it. Uh, and what, how they fast now is they keep away from anything which is uh, nigh, which they think it's nigh, you know, something that they, they sort of desire in the food, they keep away from that type of food. So they don't actually fast wholly from food or drink, but they actually just keep away from something which they, they might like, like some sweets or some fish or some meat, and they do that for the whole day. So this is still practiced amongst some uh, Christians especially the Orthodox Christians, they do uh, fast in the Lent period, which is just past now, you know, when you had Easter, this was, what they, this was their Lent period, 40 days prior to that. The Muslims, uh, the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when it came to Medina, uh, they used to fast only Yom Ashura, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to advise them to fast three days a, three days a month as well. But the fasting became obligatory when this verse was revealed in Madinat Munawwara. So there was two verses which were revealed, uh, one after the other. So the first was, Ya which is verse 1, 183 of Surah Al-Baqarah. 
And then the following verse, 185, one, is where the, actually the Ramadan, the fasting became for him. Now there's a difference in both eyes. So you might ask, what is the difference? The difference is very clear. Uh, fasting, generally, well, as a whole, is means to keep away from food, drink, and any sexual relations with your wife or husband. So this is the, the, the broad definition, the general definition. But the Ramadan in its Lughawi, in, uh, in its linguistic me meaning, it means something which is extremely hot, something which burns. And the, the scholars, they differ that whether it means, does it burn the body, or does it mean that it burns the sense. The latter was the, the most preferred uh, sort of uh, def uh, definition that it actually it's a time of year where the sins are burned for the Muslim means. So Ramadan is actually when you, when you burn something, when you, when you heat it up to such an extent that it dissolves it, it, it melts away. So obviously it's, fasting has to have the intention which we will go through the full uh, A to Z inshallah in the next few, few uh, weeks. It is also, like I mentioned, it is a purification of the soul and it is cleansing the soul. So it, it involves the inner dimensions of the body, it's the soul which is really being trained, which is being burnt in order that the, the sins dissolve with the actual burning. So the, the, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us that it is a cleanliness for the, both for the soul and for the body. And it is something that the previous nations did have in their sharia. Yeah, in the Sharia, previous to the Torah, the Injil, they had fasting in their Sharia, but it didn't remain the same, it, it changed. And when the first uh, type of fasting was prescribed for the Muslimin, it was like I mentioned, it was three days a month, and it also, they were asked to fast the Yom Ashura. The Yom Ashura is, as you all know, is the day in Muharram, that they used to fast quite regularly, before Ramadan was prescribed. But when this uh, verse was revealed, that actually became nafal. The, the song of Ashura became voluntary. You didn't have to fast that. And also the three days in the month became voluntary. So you didn't have to fast that. But the song of Ramadan was made obligatory in two stages because there's, there's the ayah which mentions it is reported by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that it is the hadith which I just mentioned now. When the Prophet sallallahu came to Medina, they used to, uh, he used to, with his companions, used to fast every three days a month on the Psalm of Ashura. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down this ayah, until the end, So here there was an option for the Muslims. But you could either fast, or you can not fast, yeah, eat and drink, and you can pay fidya, yeah, you can pay a ransom. So this was the, the situation for a while, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the ayat shahr al-Qur'an al-lahi unzila fihi al-Qur'an udal li nasi ubayinatim min al-Huda wal-Furqan faman shahida minkum al-shahra fal yasum Then the, the fasting became farad on who? On the one who is healthy, who is fine, who is present in his, in his land. But, but it was given, the concession was given for who? It was given for the marid, the one who was ill, he was unable to fast and those who are traveling. So those who are traveling and those who are ill don't have to fast. And also the, the concession was given to the elderly, those who are, who are unable to fast, those who are also in this uh, ayah. <coughs> also in this ayah, the, session, the concession is given to those who are pregnant, those who are unable to fast, who are fearful for their child. Again, it comes into the same category, but there is a difference uh, of opinion whether they just they have to make up the fast or they have to pay the fidya. Before we go to that, so how they used to fast in the uh, before, uh, you know, in the time of Ashura and the three days of the month, they used to fast. Uh, they used to break their fast at sunset, and they would usually have their uh, suhoor straight away before they go to sleep. But if they fell asleep without eating the uh, suhoor, they were not allowed to eat anything until the next day, until the sunset. So this was how the fast was in the beginning, that if you came, you'd break your fast obviously at uh, sunset, 
But then you wouldn't be able to get up for suhoor. You'd have to eat something straight away. So most they'd stay awake or someone sleep. But if you sleep, then you wouldn't be able to allow to have your suhoor. So there's a uh, trans transmission here that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam saw a person by the name of Soma, and he used to work in the daytime. And he came home. He was tired. He broke his fast. He prayed Isha, and then he slept, and he didn't eat anything until he got up in the morning. So obviously he got up and he couldn't take his uh, suhoor. So Prophet Sallallahu saw him in the daytime and he said to him, you know, what is I see you, you, you're quite, you know, weak, you, you seem to be struggling. Prophet Sallallahu he says to him, you know, I got back last night home, I came home, I, had, I didn't have anything to eat and I went to sleep. And I got up this morning without eating anything. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after this event, after this, uh, this this time, the Prophet mm -hmm. ﷺ, it was revealed to him the ayah, "Ohilla lakum laylat al-siyam rafatu ila nisaikum," until the end of the ayah where he says, "Thumma atimu siyam ila al-layl." So carry on fasting until the day means sunset, <coughs> and then you break your fast and you get up until you see the white from the black and the black from the white, which is the ayah which is revealed in the same uh, surah. So again, when this ayah was revealed, "Wa alil ladin yatiyqoon wa fidiyatun ta'amu biskin." And for those who are not able to uh, fast, for them is a ransom or a compensation to feed one person. So again, the option was there in the beginning of, uh, of, of the fast that you can fast or you, can, you, you can't fast. But then again, uh, Bukhari says that when this ayat was revealed, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَةِ Then the only people who were exempted were the elderly, male and female, who are unable to fast. So what they do? is they feed for every day they miss a poor person. So for every day they miss, they feed a poor person for the, for the 29 days or for the 30 days. There's a difference of opinion with regards to the, uh, the, the pregnant uh, woman uh, or those who are unable to uh, fast. But the majority view is that on her is to pay for every day which she misses and for her to fast as well. And also there's another opinion of, the, of Imam Bukhari, he says the same thing. As for the old person, you know, the one who has no chance or you don't think that he'll be able to fast again, then all he does, he pays the, the ransom for each day which he, uh, he misses. So those were the two types of uh, fast which were prescribed in the early days of Islam. But once this uh, ayah was revealed, it was made clear that the fasting it has its set times, it has its limits, what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do. It is all given by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in various uh, hadiths that came later. Uh, but imagine it was quite difficult. If you, if, you didn't, if you slept straight away after Isha and you didn't have anything to eat, then you'd be struggling till the next day. So really the concession, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala made it easy that at night time you can eat, you can, you can sleep. You can, uh, you can, you can, you know, you can go to your wives and your husbands, because in the daytime these things are not permissible. So why make it difficult? You know, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, you read Allah bikum al yus, wala you read bikum al yus. He doesn't want to make things hard for his for his ummah. He wants to make things easy for you. So that's why the reason was that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam brought this ayat and he he allowed the Sahaba to uh, eat and sleep at night time and to. Uh, visit their wives and husbands. So you might ask all this that you know we fast because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us so why not keep away from you know other things which we may desire you know things which we might like, things we might <coughs> want to eat, food etc. The answer, the short answer for that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he knows what is good for us. So he has told us to fast once a year for those who are able to fast, not for those who cannot fast. So really our, our, our way is to sabi'ana wa aqana, we, we heard and we obey. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in the fara'id, but don't forget that the fasting is one of the fara'id of Islam, which must be taken seriously. This is why we are preparing for it so much in advance, you know, a month and a half in advance, we try and get ready for this great month because you know you don't know when we will ha have the opportunity to you know to see another Ramadan. No one knows you know when uh, 
their time is up. So we should take every single minute of the Ramadan with its importance without sort of wasting any time in gossiping and talking, you know, which I will go into next week, inshallah, what are the, the hidden aspects, you know, the different types of uh, fasting, which I will go through next week, inshallah. So the fasting, just very briefly, consists of the time which is between sunrise to sunset. These are the, the two sort of uh, limits, the sunrise and sunset. Sunrise, it is actually before sunrise, at the time of Fajr, which there's a lot of debate about nowadays, but this, that is the general rule that sunrise, prior to sunrise, is the time of Imsar. And then the sunset is clear, it doesn't matter where you are, the sunset, in most countries, the sun does set. You know, only a few exceptions if you go to the northern countries, Scandinavia, Maybe the sun doesn't set, but even then the Prophet sallallahu has given us the, uh, the remedy. And he says you do iqda, iqda, you, 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 you apportion the night and you work out where the sunset is, where the sunrise is. So there is always a, a solution for a lot of our problems we have in the fiqh. So the Prophet sallallahu because the Sahaba, they asked him that, you know, the Prophet sallallahu narrated the hadith about the jal that the, 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 the year will be like a month, a month will be like a week, will be like a day. So the Sahaba, they asked him, okay, uh, they didn't ask him, you know, okay, oh, so what do we do? Do we fight the Dajjal? Do we uh, hide in our houses? What do we do? Do we sort of become negative? No, they asked him, so how do we pray? So he told him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that you, you apportion the night, you, you, you know, you estimate, so this is the night, this is how many hours is passed and you pray that way. So those days are to come, brother and sister Islam, the, the days of Dajjal, when you will see uh, the month like a week, week like a day, and a year like a month, those days are still to come, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and through His Prophet sallallahu has foretold us these events, and also other events which we see around us, these are all things which are to happen. Because anything that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has forecasted or he has pre-told, has most definitely become true. You see it in front of us, you know, in the in, in the modern day, a lot of the the signs which the Prophet told us about about Qiyama, you know, the uh, coming near to the day of judgment. He told us many things, and one of the things he told us that the, the barefooted shepherds of the of the of the of the desert will be competing in building high buildings. This is one of the. Uh, uh, the Nabu of the Muhammad sallallahu alaihi He told us that this is one of the signs of Qiyamah. So when the Sahaba heard this, that you know there will be no day, there will be no night, they said, well, how are we going to pray? How are we going to fast? And again, he told them, you do estimation of the time, and inshallah, everything will be okay. So I just want to mention a few things regarding the uh, the fasting. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It is well known that whenever they were uh, traveling or they were in a battle, in a ghazwa, he never forced his sahaba to, uh, to fast. He gave them the option that either you fast or you, you make up for it later on. So it's, it's, it is known that the majority of the sahaba, when they were in, it was severe heat, they would prefer not to fast. But the only two people that were fasting was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and one other of his companions. So again, it goes to show that the whole purpose of fasting is not to you know, make it difficult for the, for the Muslimin, but it's more to, to gain the benefits of the spiritual, spiritual journey. And in order that you connect with your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, after a, a break of about 11 months, you revisit this month of Ramadan, and you remember that the, the, the previous year, how good it was, how, how, how good you felt at the end of Ramadan, so this was really a full month of training for the soul and for the body that you come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, as an abd, as a, as a servant to him and you basically, you say, to, you know, you, you put everything in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you leave, you know, those things which you desire, those things which you like, you leave them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you ask him, you know, I'm here at your door inshallah and I want, you know, to come closer to you and you ask help from him in order to come closer to him, you know, you ask him for any sort of assistance. Because really, you know, in the month of Ramadan, when, when they arrive, especially this time of year, they have quite long, they're about 15, 16 hours long, maybe longer. 
and before the month of Ramadan, everyone is asking one another, you know, how are we going to, you know, do this fasting? You know, it's going to be very difficult. But do not forget that the fasting in Ramadan is much different to the normal fasts. I mean, you try to fast in any other month apart from Ramadan, how difficult it is. The month of Ramadan has a blessing in it, and the blessing is the blessing of the Quran. It was the month in which the Quran was revealed, which I'm just going to cover in the next uh, few minutes. The month of Ramadan has a special blessing. Now, if you think that you can uh, fast these days without the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you need to revisit yourself, revisit your iman, and recheck. You know, they need to get your priorities that the only way you're going to fast this month is with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not with anyone's help. No matter how fit you are, how healthy you are, how good you are, you could have been fasting the whole year. But when it comes to the month of Ramadan, the only thing which is going to get you past the finishing line, which is the day of Eid, is the assistance and the complete faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He will help you in this month of Ramadan. And we see, mashallah, we see elderly brothers and sisters who, who are quite weak, who have you know, multiple uh, medical problems. But when it comes to the month of Ramadan, they are very adamant that they are going to fast. And we see them fasting, mashallah. They fast for long hours and their, med their, their health is perfect. You hardly, they hardly complain of anything. This is all to do with the trust of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how much trust you have in Him. And don't forget, another important part is not just the fasting. The fasting is one part of the Ramadan, is also the Qiyam. Because in the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man sama ramadana imanan wa ihtisaban wa ghufira lahu. Also in another hadith, Man sama wa qama, as was a whosoever stood and fasted in the month of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive his sins. So there's also the night prayer, which uh, it could, you could call it Tarawih, you could call it Qiyam al-Layl, whatever you can call it. Going back to what I mentioned in the, in the beginning of the uh, reminder is, these are all Nawafil. Now, don't, do not restrict them to a certain amount of numbers. Do as much as you can. You know, do, Nawafil is something which will benefit you in the, in the hereafter. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings the scales forward, and he looks at your fara'id and he, and he sees something lacking in them, what's going to benefit is your nawafid. Obviously, do not neglect your fara'id because they are number one priority. You have your fara'id, your wajibad, your sunnah, your nawafid. But if there's something lacking in your fara'id, which we all lack, you know, no one is uh, perfect in the fara'id, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring the nawafid to top up the fara'id. So do not look down at the nawafid or even the sunnah, whether you pray them in the mosque, whether you pray them in the house, it doesn't make any difference. As long as you pray them, do something because what we have become unfortunately which i realized I'm just gonna have a sip of water before what we have become as an ummah it reminds me to the stories the different stories which we hear about of bani israel you know whenever their prophets they came the first thing they used to do they used to ask why what's the reason behind what is the logic behind this command you know if this was bani israel asked to fast they would have said allah subhanahu why do you want us to fast give us some you know logical explanation some people even ask nowadays, you know, the Muslim, you might get some rationalists who will say, we need some uh, rational belief, you know, that we have to fast, give me something which is solid, which I will believe in. This was, these were the traits of the Bani Israel. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in, in various uh, ayahs of the Quran, He has told us, do not follow in the footstep of the Ahl Kitab, especially the Bani Israel, because that's where they become waladdali, they become basically the maghdub and waladdali. This way they became the ones who were, so anger was upon them and those who became uh, mis mis uh, misleading and they went away from the Prophet. So when it comes to acts of worship, then we shouldn't uh, condense them to a few rituals that we do. Whatever we do in Ramadan, in the masjid, when we pray, when we do the faraid, <coughs> alhamdulillah in the jama'ah, we will get rewarded for it. But not you know, just say, okay, that's enough. Do more. Do your sunnahs, do your nawafil, whether they are in the masjid, whether they're in the house, whether they're with your family. Do as much as you can, you know, because this, this uh, op opportunity will not, might not come again. You know, only Allah knows when your time is written, the time of uh, departure. You know, every, every, everyone has their t time of arrival and we also have a time of departure. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has this knowledge, you know, no person has, even the Prophet didn't have this knowledge, but when the angel of death came to him, he was given an option, he was asked, Ya Muhammad, you know, do you want to stay here or do you want to return back to your Rabb? 
and, and obviously he, he wanted to go back to his Rabb Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so he, he chose the second option. So he was the only person who was given this option. No one else is going to be given this uh, freedom that the angel of death will come to you and ask you, oh, Fulan, do you want to stay for a few more days or do you want to go back? No. The time when he comes, he will knock on your door and that's it. He won't even ask you uh, for your permission. He will just take your soul away from us. May Allah subhanahu wa make that easy for all of us on that day when we are ready to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just to finish off, we have a few minutes left. A uh, very, very important uh, point to make is the month of Ramadan, you all know the Qur'an was revealed in the month of Ramadan. Yeah, so there's an there's a ayah in the, in the Qur'an, إِنَّ أَنزَلْنَهُ فِي لَيْلِ الْقَدْرِ So you might ask, when, how was the whole of the Qur'an revealed in one go? Because we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Qur'an in stages <coughs> over 23 years. So the meaning of this ayah is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought down the whole Qur'an from the Lohi Mahfud up to the Bayt al-Ma'mur and to the, the nearest heavens. And from there, uh, this was done on the night of Qadr in Ramadan. That is something which is confirmed. After that, the Quran was revealed according to the situation of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Wahi was revealed down to him in various occasions. As we know, when uh, his, his uncle Abu Lahab came to him and he was cursing him, then the Prophet the Allah SWT, revealed the Surah Tabbat, Ya Da Abi Lahabi Wa Tab. Also on other occasions, the Quran was revealed in order to uplift the spirits and in order to complete the mission of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and make it the final uh, mission, the final message for the whole of humankind. And that's why we see a lot of the ayahs that remain, you know, you might think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have easily, you know, abrogated some ayah, uh, verses over others, which the, it has happened in the Quran, some verses are nasa wal mansuq. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have, you know, hidden those verses, you know, some verses which we, we see nowadays Unfortunately, it's, it's problematic for even for some Muslims, you know, the, the ayahs of uh, fighting and qital and jihad and munafiqun, they see these ayahs as problematic. Now, don't you think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his power could have just kept them you know, and hidden them? No, he, he left them there for a reason, to show to the human being that this was a real book sent on the, on the right time when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa wanted a wahi, it would come straight away and it would solve the problem. When the problem came of the, the prisoners, you know, of war, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayah of prisoners of war. When the problem came of those who broke the pact with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa an order came to fight them, naturally. That's what's going to happen. You know, if somebody is, is fighting you, any religion will fight back. doesn't matter if you're the most peaceful of religion, if you are, you know, I can't remember any sort of religion to my mind, who are very, very sort of anti sort of war, even they will fight back and they will respond with the uh, same amount of force what has been uh, transgressed upon us. So all these ayahs were revealed and they were kept in the, in the Qur'an for a reason, in order to make the Qur'an uh, sort of in line with nowadays problems, because these problems can come up in the future, the problem of, you know, people sometimes ask me, you know, this ayah of milk, you mean, you know, mama, why is it still that? I say, well, brother, you don't know when this problem might arise again? Who are you to say that, you know, in war, that this situation will not arise? Why has it become such a problem for you? It, it is there. Yes, we're not saying it is, uh, you know, you don't have to implement it now because there's no need for it. But when the time might come, only Allah knows that you might have to implement it. The same goes with other ayahs of the Quran which relate to qital and jihad. They were revealed in a certain time. And you must always go back and address when were these ayahs revealed. Uh, we know this ayah of Siyam was revealed in Medina. And we know that the, the, the Muslimin, they started fasting in Medina. And also, in regards to the fasting of Ashura, there was another fasting which the when Israel, the Jews, used to fast in Medina. And that was the day when the, they were saved from Pharaoh, from Pharaoh, Musa is salam. And they used to say that they used to fast, thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also commanded the Muslims to fast in, uh, in, in relation to the... Uh, Pharaoh and his uh, Israel. So the, the Prophet وسلم, didn't say that, you know, oh, they are uh, Jews, we're not going to fast. Them. No, he said that Musa is close to us because we are prophets, we are brothers, and also Isa is also close to us because he is our brother in faith. So to finish off the month of Ramadan, it was the month in which the Quran was revealed, and also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it a special month. It was the ninth month of the uh, Hijri calendar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to refresh our iman every year. 
And also in this month, there's a, a day which is or night equivalent to a thousand months. Thousand month days, which we should all be preparing for. This is something which I will talk about, inshallah, in the third or fourth week. How should we prepare? What should we be doing? In the Taraweeh, we will cover the. Uh, I was asked last week by a brother about Taraweeh. We will cover this, inshallah, in the Etikah. And also the preparation for. <coughs> I really encourage all of you for one thing, and that is for Etikah. Those brothers, uh, sisters, you could do Etikah in the house, as with the, as with the Sunnah. Uh, the Prophet sallam, he told his wives to do the itikaf in their hujra, in the houses. There's nothing wrong with the, the woman folk doing itikaf in the houses, in an excluded or secluded uh, area of the house where they have maybe a musalla or a prayer room. And also for the men, uh, boys, if they are of age, they are able to do itikaf in the, in the masajid. And especially in the last 10 nights of Ramadan, it's very, very important that we revive this sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi something which is really uh, missing, as well as other sunnahs which I talked about uh, this morning and this afternoon. There are certain sunnahs which we sometimes neglect, and all this confusion it adds to it more. That the main focus we shift from the main focus and we focus on nawafil. Like we might not want to do the farai, but we want to do the nawafil. Now that's really something which we are doing injustice to ourselves. Focus on the faraid, then slowly go to the uh, wajibah, the sunnah, and the nawafil. If you are someone who is not even doing the uh, nawafil, the, the faraid, then you have you have no leg to stand on if you're going to ask me about the nawafil. Do your faraid first, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will enable you to do your nawafil at a, at a later stage. So get your inshallah priorities right from the beginning, and this is what something we should uh, encourage our youth uh, to come to the masjid for the five daily prayers with the uh, jama'ah, you know, the parents should be coming themselves if they can and, and also to give them a good example that if you're not doing it yourself then the children, you know, very, very difficult to convince them that, you know, if you're not coming to the masjid yourself, how can you expect your seven or eight or nine year old child to come? They're going to ask you, well, you know, father, you're not going yourself and you're asking me you to go. It's also something which is not uh, good manners. I'll finish off by one just quick uh, reminder, inshallah, that whatever we do, uh, in the month of Ramadan, it has to be done with sincerity, it has to be done with ikhlas, lillah uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala. There shouldn't be no showing off, you know. If, if you think, now this is just an advice to everyone, if you think that, you know, by standing in the middle of the mosque and reading Nawafil, that there's going to be some hint of showing off, it's better for you to be somewhere else where you are hidden away from people. The faraid you cannot keep away. You have to come to the mosque. You have to read your, your faraid, and you have to do them properly with the jama'ah. Uh, there's no uh, fear of uh, showing off ria in that. But in the nawafil, if you think that you know you're going to be uh, giving the wrong impression to the, to the brothers, then it's best not to do it. And all should be done with ikhlas because everything depends on your niyat. As we know the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in the wal-a'mal bil niyat, every every action depends on it intention. So make intention from now that we are entering the last few days of Rajab and inshallah when we enter the month of Sha'ban do not just pick the middle of Sha'ban in order to do good deeds. You know, this is my advice. Do not just pick the 15th of Sha'ban. It is very, a very important uh, day and night. No doubt about it. But I would advise myself first that you know choose the whole, pick the whole month of Sha'ban to do good deeds. You know, and when it comes to the 15th of Shaban, if you are to, if in the middle of doing good deeds, then fine, carry on. But if you just go and pick that one one day of the month and think, okay, I want to just do Salat and do Siyam on that day, then you're not doing justice to yourself, you're doing justice to the to the month. The month deserves more than that from you. The, the month deserves if you to fast at least three days, at least Monday to Thursday, Monday and Thursday, which was the Sunnah Prophet said, to fast two days, as I mentioned in the Bayan uh, last uh, Friday. So do not make things uh, difficult for yourself. Uh, unfortunately, you know, a lot of these problems, they are man-made. It's not come, these are not problems which have come from the Sharia. The Sharia is very, very straightforward. It has its limits. It has its halal and its haram clearly defined for, for the servants. It's only when we go looking for problems that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He makes sure that we get stuck in the problem. And always this is the, the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that when you turn away from Him, 
he turns away from you as well. He leaves you to dwell in your problems. So I conclude by a real sincere dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to reach this blessed month of Ramadan and Mubarak. And inshallah we will go deeper into the subjects next week. Uh, we'll go into the, uh, the asrar, asrar siyam, the hidden uh, issues of uh, the hidden, hidden aspects of the, of the uh, siyam. And also then we'll go into the, the fiqh uh, questions inshallah. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and enable us to gain and to witness this month of Ramadan and may he you know, reward all of us who are sitting here in, in the masjid and all of them who are all of us who are listening online and the sisters of Sayyidina Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all rewards in this world and the hereafter. Qul qawli hadha astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa lisa'ilu sihastaghfiru innahu huwa al-ghafur rahim If there's any uh, questions